It had been 10 years since I'd been to New Zealand, but with my mother born in the South Island, I'd been visiting this trout fishing paradise all my life. The fishing had been good 10 years earlier, and on a trip perhaps five years before that, it had also been good. What could possibly go wrong this time in the summer of 2016 17? I chose to start my travels and fishing in the North Canterbury region. The agriculture New Zealand prides itself on was the same as it had always been. The sheep and the crops were still there. However, the dairy boom the country had been experiencing was worryingly evident. So too was its obvious demand on water. Lakes and rivers were literally disappearing. It was all through the news. With the sun shining and spring flowers in full bloom, I did my best to remain optimistic and headed into the mountains. Brown and rainbow trout were what I was in search of. But with fishing generally slow, it took many days before I found some success. Bad weather, however, eventually rained on my parade and continued to do so all the way around the north coast and all down the west coast. Eventually I cut my losses and crossed through the Alps to the central South Island region. With swollen rivers and flood debris lining fences, it was obvious that the waterways here hadn't escaped the rain either. Deciding to focus my attentions on the lakes Hugging the shoreline beneath the willow trees, I found what I was looking for. They were also in the flooded shallows, brown trout, prowling the flats in search of an easy meal. In the top corner of this flooded slough, I found another two fish feeding off the surface on indistinguishable prey. I tied on a green fly, known as a spotlight caddis, hoping it might pass as a variety of prey, a willow grub, an emerging nymph perhaps, or maybe even a midge, or whatever it was they were feeding on. With the cast out towards open water, I finally fooled one of them. Finally hooked one of them. After pursuing these trying fish in the shallows virtually all day, I finally beat my way through the flooded willows onto the lake. Doing away with the dry flies, a little wet fly known as a matuka quickly proved its worth. today, first time in about six weeks, so it's been pretty nice, I've only picked up the two fish though, the sun's going down behind the mountains there so I put the dry flies away.
leaving this willow tree line lake, I ventured on towards another lake with hopes of finding similar action in the shallows. I managed to spot a few trout while fishing the flats here, but with far less aquatic plant life, it was a totally different ball game. Not until late in the day, as clouds drifted in from the west, did I finally hook a fish, a very strangely coloured rainbow. After a number of days without rain, I decided it was time to try fishing some rivers again. The first river I fished was one I had experienced success on late in the season 10 years earlier, when rainbow trout had been on their spawn run. Seeing that it was now January, I was hoping I would encounter similar success with brown trout. With flowers blanketing the riverbed, it was as beautiful as I remembered it to be. Underwater, however, things had changed for the worse. Didmo, an invasive algae from North America, was first detected in New Zealand's South Island lakes and rivers in 2004. Believed to have been brought into New Zealand by a Canadian travelling with a kayak, New Zealand's authorities have done a remarkable job of containing it keeping it out of the North Island. We as anglers should continue doing our best to keep it that way. This particular river had offered excellent indicator nymph fishing 10 years earlier, despite Didmo starting to take hold. On rivers such as this, however, where Didmo has flourished, even the most patient angler doesn't bother fishing with this technique anymore. It took me half a day before I did away with the nymph entirely. Towards the end of that first day, the dry fly finally found what I was looking for. Although my second day dawned with significant cloud cover, a wheeling fish quickly confirmed that they would still feed off the surface. Perfect conditions returned for my third and final day, and yet I couldn't connect to another fish. I'd managed only two brown trout from three full days of fishing. 
It was far from good odds as far as I was concerned. I was beginning to see a recurring theme on my travels in New Zealand South Island. And as I moved on towards the next few rivers I planned to fish, I found myself hopeful of a lot more than just good fishing. I was hoping for less didmo, less irrigation, and less fertilizer runoff, less four-wheel drives, and less helicopters, less fishing guides, and generally just less people. Call me selfish, but finding solitude while fishing is almost more important to me than finding the fish. I was thankful to be alone as I hiked upstream on the first of the next two rivers I planned to fish. The river eventually narrowed into a beautiful single stream and with no didmo present, I attached a nymph dropper to a large royal wolf dry fly. Much to my surprise, a solid rainbow quickly took a liking to the dry fly. suspected they were hiding in hard to reach corners with no appetite whatsoever it seemed. I had managed to avoid agriculture, people, guides and four-wheel drives on that first river but the next river I fished in this area unfortunately wasn't quite so fortunate. In the summer of 2017 it seemed that many of New Zealand's farmers weren't bothered by the fact that they were flogging their own land. As they grazed their livestock as close to the river as possible, bankside stabilisation efforts were non-existent. Thousands of dollars worth of fencing falling into the rivers was a common sight. Putting yet another agricultural fiasco behind me, I continued upstream on foot for miles only to find a guide and his client with a four-wheel drive already fishing. Is it not an injustice that someone makes a healthy pay packet by flying or driving to water that someone else has made the effort to hike to? It didn't come as a surprise to discover that the fish here were by no means interested in my flies. Miles from my camp, frustrated, and somewhat at a loss, I tied on a weighted matuka and started fishing my way back downstream. The next two central South Island rivers I fished weren't free from agricultural impact either, but I hoped to distance myself from it as best I could. It was a beautiful evening when I arrived, but unfortunately the weather didn't hold until the morning. Wind and bad weather was threatening as I headed upstream on the first of the two rivers, but once again 
it didn't take too long for a trout to show me that they would still feed off the surface despite the gloomy conditions. Although I'm probably more fond of brown trout, I was still excited to discover that the fish I was pursuing here were predominantly rainbows. The next fish I encountered that day took off downstream in true rainbow trout fashion. The sun returned on my next day here. However, as I headed off towards the second river on foot, I suspected there would still be plenty of wind to go with it. Sure enough, by the time I crept in towards my first fish, the wind was whistling downstream relentlessly. Wind blows insects onto the water, however, and it can often be the catalyst that's required to get fish feeding. There were some beautiful pools on this little stream, but it seemed the trout were only willing to live in the largest of them. I got onto my next fish by walking the fly downstream along one of the larger pools I found, a technique that I like to call walking the dog. By the end of the day, gusts of wind up to 40 knots were steamrolling dust clouds of glacial silt down the valley and literally blowing me back to my camp. It was time to move on again. I found
found myself back on a lake the following morning and with conditions incredibly calm, even the birds were out fishing. Microscopic surface prey was on the menu that glassy morning and the seemingly abundant fish proved to be quite a challenge. It was only when the wind strengthened and I tried fishing a nymph that I finally managed to hook one of them. I approached the lake from a willow tree line bank the following morning. Colloquially known as bullies, small native galaxids were coming under attack in the shallows. Surface prey was still on the menu and it was with tiny dry flies that I persevered and was quickly rewarded with two little browns. The new day eventually burnt off the cloud cover and the fish became even easier to spot. Catching them was another story entirely. Changing flies to the smallest elk hair caddis I had in my fly box, I finally found some success. Before travelling further south into the region of Otago, there was one last river I wanted to investigate in the central South Island. On the way to that river, I decided to camp another night on the Willow Tree Line Lake that had both frustrated and served me well a few weeks earlier. I arrived with enough light for a fish before dark.
Just after sunrise the following morning, I found a fish feeding off the surface right in front of my camp. I wasted no time tempting it with the same little dry fly. seemed to be willing to play ball that morning, so before travelling to the river, I waded out onto the lake with hopes of catching another fish. With the wind picking up, it ended up coming courtesy of a nymph rather than a dry fly. After such a good start to the day, I couldn't help but have high hopes for the river I headed off in search of. Sadly, however, my high expectations were washed away by what was becoming a typical scene in New Zealand's South Island. Green nitrification slime due to excessive fertiliser runoff, and to make matters worse, the Didmo was also thick. It was time to leave the central South Island region and head south into the regions of Otago and Southland. Hopefully there I would find better water management and the bigger trout I was hoping to find. <laughs> 